He was hailed as the victor of Vicksburg, the hero of Appomattox, the savior of the Union. If there had been paparazzi in the late 19th century, no American's picture would have been more coveted than that of General Ulysses S. Grant. There were no movie stars in that period of time. There were very few authors that were well known. There was no television. Grant was as close to a star celebrity in the United States in the late 1860s and 1870s as you could have had. Well, in 1868, there's no doubt but that Grant was the most popular man in the North. It was almost a shoe in to become the Republican presidential candidate. I think enough people told him that he should be president that he kind of became convinced. Then why not become president if people are willing to make you president, right? Number 18, Ulysses Simpson Grant, Republican, 1869 to 1877, 46 years old, from Ohio. At the time, he was the youngest man ever to be elected president and the first West Pointer. He was also the first to be elected without winning a majority of the white vote. That's because blacks in the South were allowed to cast ballots for the first time, and roughly 700,000 did, 12% of the total vote. They voted almost, I think, to a man for Grant. They viewed him just as they had viewed Lincoln as central to their emancipation. Loyal to a fault, the silent general was humble and shy. As a soldier in the field, he would bathe in a closed tent so others wouldn't see him in the nude. He was also a surprisingly good artist. Some of his drawings and paintings still survive. Military heroes like Grant are supposed to cut a gallant figure in their uniforms, but descriptions of him range from rumpled to reeking of cigar smoke. Grant certainly was not a gallant figure. In fact, he was short, looked a little bit dumpy because of the way he carried himself. <laughs> Grant was pretty short and kind of schleppy, to use a modern phrase. He frequently had a cigar in his mouth, which made him look a little more disheveled. In addition to his smoking habit, 20 cigars a day, President Grant was an adrenaline junkie. In an era before automobiles, he relied on pure horsepower to satisfy his need for speed. In 1866, he won an impromptu drag race through Central Park against a coach carrying President Andrew Johnson. As president, he once got a speeding ticket for driving his horse-drawn carriage too fast down M Street. He paid a $20 fine. Not surprisingly, Grant's approach to the presidency was similar to his approach on the battlefield. He seemed to feel at the beginning, Grant, that the president was like a military commander. He had subordinates. The subordinates would be loyal to him. He had a tendency, however, to appoint cronies, relatives of his wife, old buddies from the army days to positions of power in his administration, which they then, in many cases, proceeded to abuse. In a way, Grant saw his presidency as a continuation of his service in the Civil War. When Grant was nominated for president, he said, let's resolve these questions that are left over from the war. Uh, let us have peace. Those simple, elegant words became his campaign slogan, let us have peace. As it turned out, Grant's administration was anything but peaceful. It had started off well enough. Most of the seceded states had been restored to the Union, and black voters, emboldened by the support of federal troops, had elected Republican governments in many southern states. But the lasting hatreds of war had not died at Appomattox. There were those in the North who wanted to punish the South, and those in the South who wanted to punish blacks. The Ku Klux Klan was really the terrorist wing of the Democratic Party at that time. There is a kind of an almost another civil war going on in the South. Terrorist groups are launching murder, assassination, whippings, beatings, burnings of buildings in order to undermine the governments there. What does the federal government do about this? Grant, working with Congress, essentially launched a war on terror. Using new powers granted to him by a series of anti-Klan laws, he sent federal troops to the hotbeds of violence in the South to round up Klansmen and even hold them without trial. Grant crushes the Klan. He succeeds. You can do that if you're willing to be pretty harsh. He crushes the Ku Klux Klan. 
Thanks to Grant's effort, 1872 was the most peaceful year the South had seen since the Civil War. But like the eye of a hurricane, the peace was a false calm for the president and for America. Late in Grant's first term, a spate of scandals began to emerge among his trusted subordinates, tarnishing the reputation of the hero of Appomattox and turning Grant's name into a synonym for corruption. It seemed to America that the president was asleep at the wheel. Oh my God, you've got Credit Mobilier, you've got the whiskey ring, you've got people lining their pockets from the federal coffers. Where was Grant? Where was this great general? I think it's true. Grant didn't know the whiskey rings were going on, the Indian frauds were going on, the Credit Mobilier scandal was going on. There's no evidence that Grant personally profited from any of this stuff. But he also had a rather naive faith in his subordinates. Even though he wasn't personally involved, they put a taint on his administration because, as another president said, the buck stops here. Despite the scandals, Grant's enduring popularity earned him a decisive re-election in 1872. His second term was marred by an escalation in Southern violence. Things began to fall apart after Grant was re-elected in 1872. Uh, one Southern state after another was recaptured by the Democrats. Violence continued. During his first term, Grant didn't hesitate to quell violence in the South by sending federal troops. But the political climate of his second term would not allow for such bold executive action. In 1873, an economic depression in the North contributed to a shift in public opinion about the problems of Reconstruction in the South. People didn't want to hear about it anymore. They didn't want to pay for it anymore. Americans do have short attention spans. And the idea of an endless occupation of the South, very few people had stomach for it. So by 1875, when the governor of Mississippi asked for federal troops to end an outbreak of electoral violence, Grant failed to act. By the end of his presidency, Grant is sitting by without doing anything as one after another of these southern governments are basically overthrown by terrorist groups and Reconstruction is coming to an end. Reconstruction wasn't Grant's only challenge. Another confounding domestic issue of the day was Indian affairs. Grant came into office hoping to pursue a peace policy towards the Indians. But it doesn't happen. There is no peace. There is more war. It was during Grant's second term that George Armstrong Custer and his 7th Cavalry were annihilated by Indians on the banks of the Little Bighorn River. Custer's last stand was the exception. Usually it was the Indians who were massacred. Tragically, during his administration, conflict not only continued between the army and the settlers in the West and the Indians, but actually intensified. In the end, President Grant is remembered more for his magnificent failures than his well-intentioned efforts. Grant's administration is considered one of the real failed administrations in, in American history often ranks right at the bottom, just above Richard Nixon. But Grant's stock is rising in recent years. In a lot of ways, he is not remembered and not credited for the really astonishing steps toward black equality that occurred during his two terms in office. It is this effort, endorsed by a man of war who fought for peace, attempted but never fully realized during his administration that may be the true legacy of Grant's presidency. Ulysses Grant hated hunting, despised harsh treatment of animals, and the sight of blood made him physically ill. <laughs>